Hello people and welcome back to this grey and dreary Sunday so I will read a couple of chapters of this book and we are on a chapter for people the heathen customs okay according to a lately discovered inscription Tiglath Pileser king of Assyria says that he conquered 42 countries and brought them under one god and placed them under the Magian religion Sun Worship, Wallace's Herodotus, Note Volume 1, page 348. We have already shown that the two tribes of Israel were taken into captivity by the above-named king, and now we propose bringing forward a few of the many interesting facts which show how deeply the idolatrous customs of our ancestors have taken root as to enable us to the present time to establish the co-relationship of certain customs and habits still embedded in our national life with those of Israel under heathen influences. This may be an unpleasant subject to refer to, but if a heathen writer could say, Socrates I love, and Plato I love, but I love truth more, how much more we who profess to be children of the God of truth. So we've got the worship of Baal, and this is what I've, um, I've done a lot of research into this, and this is, this Baal has been seen as a Mesopotamian God, um, Phoenician um, it comes from the Levant area, um, and the more I look at it, the customs, the Celts worship Baal, and the Celts worship Moloch. And it's funny, this is a wee bit off topic, but on one of the, I think it's Skyrim, one of the latest Skyrim games, the final boss is called Moloch Baal, and Skyrim's kind of based on European medieval kind of stuff, so there's a wee, a wee Easter egg for you. Right, the worship of Baal. The Israelites were prone to idolatry, and the worship of Baal, a god of the Phoenicians, constituted their chief offence against God. We find, consequently, many evidences in Great Britain and Ireland of the continuance of some of the rites, long after the rays of the sun of righteousness had dispelled the darkness that brooded over the land. In Calmet's Dictionary of the Bible, edited by J. Taylor, we will be found some interesting statements and customs on the subject. The worship of Bel, Belus, was generally throughout the British Islands and certain of its rites and observances are still maintained among us, notwithstanding the spread and establishment of Christianity during so many ages. It might have been thought that the pompous rituals of popery would have superseded the druidical superstitions or that the reformation to Protestantism would have banished them, but the fact is otherwise. Surely the roots of Druidism were struck extremely deep. What charm could render them so prevalent and permanent? A town in Persia on the borders of the highlands is called Tilly Beltane, the rising ground of the fire of Baal. In the neighbourhood is a Druidical temple of eight upright stones where it is supposed the fire was kindled. At some distance from this, another temple of the same kind, but smaller, and near it, a well still... A Near it, a well still held in great veneration. On Beltane morning, superstitious people go to this well and drink of it. Then they make a procession around it, as we are formed, nine times. After this, they, in like manner, go round the temple. And this is where you see the Celtic symbol of the, the spiral. They had this thing about going around things. Um, the spiral was a very important symbol for the Celts. And it has to go a certain way. It can't go that way, spiral. It has, it has to go that way from left to right because I think it represents the sun rising, setting, rising, setting. Anyway. So deep-rooted is this heathenish superstition in the minds of many who reckon themselves good Protestants that they will not neglect these rites. And when Beltane falls on Sabbath, Statist, Accounts of Scotland, Volume 3, page 105. On the first day of May, which is called Beltan, or Beltane Day, all the boys in a township meet in the moors. They cut a table in the green sod of a round figure by casting a trench in the ground of such circ circumference as to hold the whole company. They kindle a fire and dress a repast of eggs and milk in the consistence of a, yog a custard. And I've already covered this in my Baal Moloch uh, video. They need a cake of oatmeal, which is toasted at the embers against a stone. After the custard is eaten up, they divide the cake into so many portions 
as similar as possible to one another in size and shape, as there are persons in the company. They daub one of these portions all over with charcoal until it is perfectly black. They put all the bits of cake into a bonnet. Every one blindfolded draws out a portion. He who holds a bonnet is entitled to the last bit. Whoever draws the black bit is a devoted person who is to be sacrificed to Baal, whose favour they mean to implore in rendering the year productive of the sustenance of man and beast. There is little doubt of these inhuman sacrifices having once been offered in this country as well in the East, although they now pass from the act of sacrificing and only compel the devoted person to leap three times through the flames, with which the ceremonies of this festival are closed. In the worship of Baal, as practiced by the idolatrous Israelites in the days of their apostasy, the worship of the sun's image was equally observed, and it is striking to find that the image of the sun, which apostate Israel worshipped, was erected above the altar. Josiah, we are informed in 2 Chronicles, caused the altars of Baalim to be broken down in his presence, and the images that were on the high above them he cut down. These were sun, sun images, margin sun images. For all this, it is manifest that the image of the sun above or on the altar was one of the recognised symbols of one who worshipped Baal or the sun. And he in a so-called Christian church, a brilliant plate of silver in the form of a sun, is so placed in the altar that everyone who adores, adores at the altar must bow down in a lowly reverence before that image of the sun. Whence, I ask, could that have come but from the ancient sun worship or the worship of Baal to Babylon's? Page, pages 265 and 266. Now here that Hurd says when describing the, the Romish altar, a plate of silver in the form of a sun is fixed opposite to the sacrament on the altar, which with the light of the tapers makes a most brilliant appearance. And this is where I think the ancient Celts moved from worshipping polytheistic gods to monotheistic gods. I think that the Celts worshipped many gods and one of them was the sun. One, they had sea gods, they had uh, fertility gods, they had all kinds of gods. And I think a massive catastrophe changed all this. I think when a comet comes down, all these gods are rendered useless. Because if a massive catastrophe, like a comet hits the earth or your country, the, the sky's cloud up, you can't grow, it's, it's, it's like a... It's like a um, apocalypse, a so-called apocalypse. So the sun, the sun god can't come out. Um, the moon god's gone, the goddess. Um, so I think the Celts eventually realise there is only one god that renders all the, the rest of these gods in the sky useless. And this god came down to earth from the sky. The fallen star. And this is where I think the the idea of following one god instead of all these other gods came into being. Anyway, that's just my own theory. Right, Easter. And this is where I think Christianity has its roots in Britain, the, the monotheism. Maybe the Zoroastrians, the Persians, had their own form of monotheism, but I think the Celts had their own form as well, after worshipping Baal and Moloch. Right, Easter. The children gather wood, the fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead their dough to make cakes to the Queen of Heaven. Astarte, consort of Baal, is called Ishtar on the Assyrian monuments, see Laird's Nineveh, page 629, and worshipped under the title of Queen of Heaven. The ancient votaries of the Babylonian goddess used to fast for 40 days in the spring of the year, and the custom is still observed by the Yazidis, or pagan devil worshippers of Kurdistan, the very place be it remembered, where the Israelites were placed by tiglath Pileser, Laird's Nineveh. The ancient pagan Britons called April Easter Monath, whereas the festival early observed by professing Christians, which answers to our modern Easter, was Pash, or the Passover, and it was not preceded by Lent or connected with the resurrection, as Geisler in his Catholic Church section 53, page 178, informs us, which was commemorated by the observance of Sunday. If our blessed Saviour was crucified in the springtime, in April or March, there would have been no need for Peter to have warmed himself at the fire that was kindled in the midst of the court, as it is pretty warm in Palestine at that season of the year. Easter. 
it is no honour to our translators that this word occurs in the English Bible in Acts. It should have been Passover, which Feast of the Jews we well know. Easter is a word of Saxon origin and imports a goddess of the Saxons, or rather of the East, and is no other than Astarte, Easterte, Eastert, in honour of whom sacrifices being annually offered about the Passover time of the year, spring. The name became attached by association of ideas to the Christian festival of the resurrection, which happened at the time of the Passover. Hence we say Easter Day, Easter Sunday, but very improperly, as we do by no means refer the festival and kept to the goddess Ishtar of the ancient Saxons. Kalmut's Dictionary, page 358. The authors of the revised version of the New Testament have corrected the mistake and used the word Passover instead of Easter. The hot cross buns on Good Friday and the dyed eggs of Pash or Easter Sunday figured in the Chaldean pagan rites just as they do now. The buns known to us by identical name were used in the worship of the Queen of Heaven, the goddess Ishtar, as early as the days of Kekrops, the founder of Athens, that is, 1500 years before the Christian era. One species of sacred bread, says Bryant, Mythology, Volume 1, page 373, which used to be offered to the gods, was of great antiquity and called bone. Hislop's Two Babylons, page 174. As Easter is associated with eggs, we find that Venus or Astarte is said to have been hatched by doves from a wondrous egg that fell from heaven into the Euphrates River and was rolled ashore by the fishes. The ancient Druids bore an egg as the sacred emblem of their order. Davies Druids, page 208. The Reverend A. Hislop says that the Druidic system in all its parts was evidently the Babylonian system. Dionysus informs us that the rites of Bacchus were duly celebrated in the British Islands. Pinaregesis, volumes 565, page 29. And Strabo cites Artemidoros to show that on an island close to Britain, Ceres and Pros Proserpine were venerated with rites similar to the orgies of Sam Samothrace. The druidical deity, Corn is related to the song of Taliesin, Davies' British Druids, page 230, to have occurred in the anger of Ceredwin, the British Ceres, and to have fled in the terror in the form of a bird, but was pursued by the lady in the form of a sparrowhawk. But just as she was about to seize her, she assumed the form of a single grain of wheat and dropped upon a heap of clean wheat upon the floor. Ceredwin then took the form of a hen, scratched him out and swallowed him, the result was that she became pregnant and was delivered of so a lovely babe that she had not the resolution to put him to death. So that's where your Easter comes from. Christmas cake. Popularly known among ourselves, Yule Day proves at once its pagan and Babylonian origin. Yule is the Chaldean name for an infant or a little child. And as the 25th of December was called by our pagan Anglo-Saxon ancestors Yule Day, or the Child's Day, and the night that preceded it, Mother's Night, Sharon Turner's Anglo-Saxons, Volume 1, page 219, long before they came into contact with Christians, that sufficiently proved its real character. In Scotland, at least in the lowlands, the Yule Cakes, i.e. Christmas Cakes, are also called Nur Cakes. Now, in Chaldee, Nur signifies birth. Therefore, Nur Cakes are birth cakes. The Cross that which is now called the Christian cross was originally no Christian emblem at all. So before we get into this, people, I've got my own theory about the cross. I think the cross evolved from the Celtic cross. But I think the Christian cross also evolved not from the crucifix of Jesus getting crucified like that, but of someone standing welcoming, someone standing with their arms out. Because I've seen carved Jesus in this form with his hands out, but not being crucified, but welcoming. It's like a welcome to stand with your arms out, is to welcome you in. Um, and this is where I think the cross comes from, the, the welcoming. Um, and the Romans have turned it into death. But I think it's more to do with love, to be honest with you. Anyway, that's my own theory. Um, I'll need to make a whole new video about that, to be honest. The cross. That which is now called the Christian cross was originally no Christian emblem at all, but was the mystic tau of the Chaldeans and Egyptians. 
the true original form of the letter T, initial of the name of Tammuz, which in Hebrew, radically the same as ancient Chaldee, as found in coins, was formed as in number five of the accompanying woodcut. To identify Tammuz with the sun, it was joined sometimes to the circle of the sun as in number seven. Sometimes it was inserted in the circle as in number eight. Whether the Maltese cross, which the Romish bishops append to their names as a symbol of their episcopal dignity, as a letter T may be doubtful, but there seems to be no reason to doubt that the Maltese cross is an express symbol of the sun, for Layard found it a sacred symbol in Nineveh, and such a connection has led them to identify it with the sun. Layard's Nineveh, volume 2, page 446. There's hardly a pagan tribe where the cross has not been found. The cross was worshipped by the pagan Celts long before the incarnation and death of Christ. It is a fact, says Morris, Indian Antiquities, volume 4, page 49. Not less remarkable than well attested that the Druids in their groves were accustomed to select the most stately and beautiful tree as an emblem of the deity they adored, and having cut the side branches, they affixed two of the largest of them to the highest part of the trunk in such a manner that these branches extended on each side like the arms of a huge cross, and on the bark in several places was also inscribed the letter Thou, a Tau, two Babylons, pages 323-325. Figure 1. A sacred Egyptian Tau, T, or sign of life, with a handle from Warring Ceramic Art, where it is placed at the corner of the throne of an Assyrian monarch. It is depicted also in Rawlison's Herodotus in the hands of an Egyptian god, in the same way as may be seen in India in the hands of the deities Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiv. The Union Jack. Figures 2 and 3 are crosses of ancient Buddhist coins. Figure 4 is a similar cross sculpted on the gate of the top at Sanchi, India, representing a banner not unlike our British Union Jack. The cross, says Colonel Walford in the Asiatic researches, though not an object of worship among the Bodhas, is a favourite emblem and device with them. It is exactly the cross of the Manichaeans, with leaves and flowers springing from it. This cross, putting forth leaves and flowers, and fruit also, I am told, is called the Divine Tree, the Tree of the Gods, the Tree of Life and Knowledge, and productive of whatever is good and desirable and placed in the terrestrial paradise. So, this symbol could have started off as a tree and then morphed into a man with his arms out. Isus. Isus. This is what I'm kind of thinking with the, with the cross. Compare this with the language of, cause, because Jesus, whatever is good and desirable and placed in the terrestrial paradise, heaven. Compare this with the language of Rome applied to the cross and it will be seen how, how exact is the coincidence. Hail, O cross, triumphal wood, the salvation of the world. Among trees there is none like thee in leaf, flower and bud. But when it is considered that the Buddhists, like the Babylonian cross, was a recognised emblem of Tammuz, who was known as the mistletoe branch, or all heal, then it is easy to see how the sacred initial T should be represented as covered with leaves, and how Rome, in adopting it, shall call it the medicine which preserves the healthful, heals the sick, and does what mere human power alone could never do. Hislop's Two Babylons, pages 326-327. So here you've got figure two. A cross that looks like a star. And then the figure three, you can see the evolution of it. In figure four, you can see the, the resemblance with the Union Jack. With this, these crosses. The combination of the crosses of St George and of St Andrew produced the first Union Jack, which was declared in AD 1606 by King James I to constitute the national ensign of Great Britain. Boutel's Heraldry, page 27. The initial letter of Tammuz, T, from Hebrew coins, is also an Egyptian symbol from Quito's Bible, Cyclopedia, volume 1, page 495. Figure 6. Do. Etrurian from Sir. W. Betham's Etruria, Volume 1, page 54. Figures 7 and 8, the Tau, or Tammuz, connected with the circle emblem of the sun, Lay Lay Layard's Nineveh in Babylon, page 211. Nineveh, Volume 2, page 446, is also found on ancient Hindu shields. Figure 9 is a very ancient and widely spread file thought called Cramponi 
by the French antiquarians and Thor's hammer mark by the Scandinavians. Dr. Schleiman in his Troy mentions having dug up from the ruins of ancient Troy many crosses of this form on objects of baked clay. Called in Sanskrit for the origin is Indian, swastika, and another cross called the same name and of like shape. They were large fire machines, the fire being produced by friction. Thus, the cross beams were placed on the ground horizontally and a piece of wood named pramantha dropped perpendicularly in a centre hole and worked by a string produced the sacred fire. So here people you can see figures 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 and 10. The different forms of cross. And you see number 8 is a well known Celtic. Number seven looks like the Enki, the Egyptian one. The first one looks like the your typical Christian one. Obviously we've got the swastika in number nine. Number ten, that's like the rosy cross. Um, it's almost like the, the Rosicurian symbol with a cross in the heart. Anyway, back to the book. This fire was called Agni. His mother, the swastika, is the Indian god goddess, Maya. Cabelli or Venus, and I've done videos about Cabelli as well. They are common, natural, and very ancient signs in India. The footprints of Buddha, carved on the Amaverte tope, are signed with them, and the prows of the ships of King Rama, which over 1000 years BC crossed the Ganges, were marked with this holy sign. From the very remotest times, they were the most sacred symbols of our Aryan forefathers. Edinburgh Review, October 1870, The Cross, Heathen and Christian, by M. Brock, page 2, 28. I'll be checking these books out as well uh, in the future. Georgi in his Alphabetum Tibetanum, page 460, speaking of the file thought, says, It is the likeness of a cross which the Zykate Tibetani, the Tibetan Buddhists, hold in honour, as regards the Indian coins on which the swastika occurs. It appears to belong to the pure Buddhist coins found at Behat, near Saharanpur which are assignable to about 300 BC. Mr. E. Thomas on the earliest Indian coinage, Num Numismatic Chronicle, New Series, Volume 4, ascribes them to the reign of Karanta, a Buddhist Indian king prior to the contemporary with Alexander about 330 BC, and in his symbols appears to place the swastika amongst those of the sun. Warring's Ceramic Art, page 83. Figure 10, heart and cross combined, emblem of goodness, see Sir Gardner Wilkinson's Ancient Egyptian Volume 1, is found on Egyptian hieroglyphics, all over the doorways of temples, etc. Figure 11, a cross in the hand of Astarte, Queen of Heaven, the Syrian or Phoenician Venus, warring ceramic art, plate 39, also, see, also coins of Astarte in the British Museum. This figure reminds us of Britannia with a trident, Shiv, the Indian god, Shiv, the Indian god, Poseidon, the Grecian, the Grecian, and Neptune, the Roman water god, all of whom are represented with the tridents. Figure 12. Double triangles, a sacred sign in India, the cross by M. Brock, page 21 to 25. In Warning Ceramic Art, plate, figure 24, is a sketch of a symbol of the goddess Bowani, consisting of double triangles. As you can see here, people, the goddess holding the cross. This looks like the Judaic star, Star of David. And that's the 14, looks like the papal version. But you can see the tri you can see where the triangle comes in, the two triangles, and that the the papal sign. And the other two are just standard crosses. This one's equal on all sides, so it's more like the Celtic cross. Or this one, figure 15, is more like the Christian. As above, shown with a small circle inside and a double circle circumscribed with eight flame-like rays radiating and having a letter inscribed on each of them. We find, says Waring, in his description of Plate 32 in Moore's Hindu pantheon, that it is used by the Brahmins to signify the powers of Siva and Vishnu, or fire and water in conjunction. These are, and have always been, the purifying elements. Amongst the Hindus, these interlaced triangles are of the most remote antiquity and from them probably have been received by other nations as an emblem of the deity. The ancient Jews, that most superstitious of all superstitious people, regarding the double triangle as talismanic. M. Nork 
Sheba states that it has a Jewish talisman called the Shield of David. Similar double triangles have been found in Roman mosaic pavement in Algeria. The ancient Syrian cross, a Syrian cross. A Maltese cross on a life-size image of Samus Fool, son of Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, to be seen in the British Museum, was worn by him at least 800 years BC, also worn by a Assur, Nazir, Pal, and Tiglath, Pelissar, Assyrian kings. Maltese crosses were found by M. Rassam at Kalak on the east bank of the Tigris, 5 times 24th August 1878. Figure 14, combination of the Greek letters Chi and Rho, X and P, was Constantine's adoption of the heathen cross as his sign on the banners of his army. Figure 15, pagan cross of the Mexicans as a symbol of their Messiah, Tammuz. Tamu, Tammuz, question mark. Prescott thus informs us of the conversion of the Mexicans by the Spaniards from the worship of the rain god whose emblem was a cross. Their conversion was no further than the transfer of their homage from one cross to another, from the cross of the rain god to the same cross as the emblem of Christ's salvation. History of Mexico, page 1292. Figure 16. A cross in gold, lately discovered by Dr. Schleiman at Mycenae in Greece, in the supposed tomb of Agamemnon, the leader of the expedition against Troy, and represented as being worn by one of the heroes engaged against Thebes about 1000 years BC. Figure 17 is the head of the goddess Diana, with a cross as the emblem of the sun over her head, a star and a crescent being on either side of her in the original, though not shown here. The Eastern Aspect. There is no doubt but that the custom of erecting churches and cathedrals so that the chancel with the communion table shall be placed in the east end of the sacred edifice is borrowed from heathen sources. And with the custom of turning towards the east when repeating the creed may be traced back to the remotest times in connection with the worship of the sun under the primitive Magian system of idolatry in use amongst the ancient Babylonians, Woden and Adon and the Syrians, from whom the Greeks and Romans evidently borrowed their systems. In Potter's Antiquities, Volume 1, page 223, we are informed, wherever they, the heathen temples of Greece, stood, if the situation of the place would permit, it, it was contrived that, the windows being open, they might receive the rays of the rising sun. The frontispiece, i.e. front entrance, was placed towards the west, because it was an ancient custom amongst the heathen to worship with their faces towards the east. If we turn now to Ezekiel, we shall see that the turning of the face towards the east and worshipping the sun towards the east is spoken of as a greater abomination than that of a woman weeping for Tammuz at the door of the gate of the Lord's house. This abomination, it is true, was done by Judah, but Israel was no better, see Jeremiah 3, and was exiled for her idolatrous worship of the sun. Woden Odin, or Woden, the Scandinavian war god, after whom one of the days of the week, Wednesday, Wodnesdag, was called, as also several places in England, such as Wanborough, formerly Wodnesborough in Surrey, Wednesbury in Staffordshire, Woodnesbury in Kent, and two sons, Balder and Thor, Thorsdag Thursday. It's funny because when we were coming up from um, uh, Cheltenham, when I was working, we went past a sign, and I think it was Wednesbury. I think it was. It's like Wednesbury. That looks like Wednesday, but Wednesbury. I just thought it was a strange place name. It's like seeing a place called Fry, Fry the Ducky, or something like that. Like something that looks like Friday, a day of the week. Balder is Chaldaic for Balzer. You see the Baal. Now Baal and Adon both mean Lord. The seed of Baal, therefore, signifies the seed of Adon. Now, Nimrod, the great war god of Babylon, is known as Adon, which is synonymous with Odin, who also had a son called Thoros. Again, Nimrod, in the character of Bacchus, was regarded as the god of wine. Odin is represented as taking no food but wine. We thus observe the identity of the Scandinavian god Odin and Adon of Babylon. It is, moreover, interesting to notice that Agnes Strickland, in volume 1 of our Queens of England, says that the pedigree of Matilda, of the Saxon line of Edgar Aetheling, was traced through Woden to the Patriarch, our Scythian ancestors, page 8. 
and also Kemble in his Saxons in England, volume 1, pages 441, says, The royal family of every Anglo-Saxon kingdom, without exception, traces its descent from Woden. Woden is, like Ulysses, preeminently the wanderer, and they shall be wanderers among the nations. Hosea. The Woden here referred to was very probably the name of some renowned ancestor, called after the Scandinavian war god, a custom very prevalent among idolatrous nations, and not the deity Odin who have been identified with the Bab Babylonian Adon. Odin's capital, Asgard, about 30 miles north of Lake Van Vide, Colonel Gollar's Dan, page 31, was supposed to be between the Euxine and Caspian Seas. The chronicles of the Swedish kings commences with an account of a people in the east of the river Tana Quizzel, the Danastrom or Danube. The people were governed by a pontiff, King Odin. These people introduced the worship of Odin into Denmark and Sweden. Moore's Pillar Stones, page 149. St. Swithin's Day. I've never heard of that. An ancient superstition still current and often referred to, if not actually believed in now, is that if it rains on St. Swithin's Day, it will rain uninterruptedly for 40 days afterwards. St. Swithin's was no Christian saint. The patron saint of the 40 days reign was just Tammuz or Odin, who was worshipped among our ancestors as the incarnation of Noah, in whose time it rained 40 days and 40 nights without intermission. Tammuz and Saint Swithin then must have been one and the same. Tammuz was recognised as the incarnation of the devil, who was known in the east by the name Saitan or Satan. It had evidently been known to the Druids, and that in connection with the flood or they say that it was the son of Scython that, under the influence of drink, let in the sea over the country, so as to overwhelm a large and populous district. Davies Druids, page 198. Now the Anglon Saxons, when they received that name, in the very same way as they made Odin into Woden, would naturally change Scython into Swithin, and thus, in St. Swithin's day, and the superstition therewith connected, we have at once a striking proof of the wide extent of devil worship in the heathen world, and of the thorough acquaintance of our pagan ancestors with great scriptural fact of the forty days, incessant rain and the deluge, Hislop's two Babylons, page 459. St. John's Day. St. John's Day is set down in the papal calendar for the 24th of June, or Midsummer's Day, which day was fixed by the Chaldeans as the first of their month Tammuz. The pagan ceremonies in connection with the worship of Tammuz were celebrated at this period, hence the Gregorian policy of incorporating heathen festivals into the Roman calendar. Bower's Lives of the Popes, volume 2, page 523, was adopted. The festival of Tammuz, who was called also Ones, or Ones, was converted into the festival of the Nativity of St. John, alias Joannes. It was found that six months exactly intervened between 24th of June and the 25th of December. The Yule festival corresponded exactly with the difference in time between the birth of Christ and that of John the Baptist. The Chaldeans reckoned their day, as did the Hebrews, from evening to evening. Consequently, the midsummer fires of St. John Eve are lit on the evening of 23rd of June, at the very hour that ushered in the festival of Tammuz. And I looked into the St. John, and I think St. John started off as Sean, S-E-A-N, because the Celts, the ancient Celts, didn't use Jais. They didn't have Jais. And same with um, who was the one, Jonas, that got swallowed up from the, the whale. Jonas. Um, Rona. Ronas is another Celtic god um, that's connected with Jonas, I think. And St. John is Sean, or Shoni. Shoni was a, a Celtic god who was in the sea. He was a sea god. And what the, the, the Celtic people used to do was make an offering to the sea. And nowadays, I think they, they pour a glass of wine or a glass of beer or ale into the sea. And this is, so the sea gives back um, seaweed to fertilise the fields. It was a fertility thing. So I think Shawnee then turned to Sean, S-E-A-N, then turned to John. Um, and this is where I think John comes from, Sean. Anyway, I, I, uh, I, I sort of went off topic there. But anyway, now I'm on topic. Right, birth of Christ and all. Right. 
As it was found that six months exactly intervened between the 24th of June and 25th of December, the Yule Festival, corresponding exactly with the difference in time between the birth of Christ and that of John the Baptist. The Chaldeans reckoned the day as did the Hebrews from evening to evening. Consequently, the midsummer fires of St. John's Eve are lit on the evening of the 23rd of June at the very hour that ushered in the festival of Tammuz. Wait, I've already read that bit. On the great festival of the Irish peasantry, St. John's Eve, it is a custom at sunset on that evening to kindle immense fires throughout the country, built, like our bonfires, to a great height, the pile being composed of turf, bogwood and such other combustible substances as they can gather. The fire being kindled, a splendid blaze shot up, and for a while they, the peasants, stood contemplating it, with faces strangely, strangely disfigured by the peculiar light emitted when the bogwood was thrown on it. When the fire burned for some hours and got low, an indispensable part of the ceremony commenced. Everyone present at the peasantry passed through it, and several children were thrown across the sparkling embers, while a wooden frame of some eight feet long with a horse's head fixed to one end, and a large white sheet thrown over it, concealed the wood, and the man on whose head it was carried made its appearance. This was greeted with loud shouts, as the white horse, and having been safely carried by the skill of its bearer, several times through the fire with a, gold, with a bold leap. It pursued the people who ran screaming in every direction. I asked what the horse was meant for, and was told it represented all cattle. Here, adds the authoress, was the old pagan worship of Baal, if not of Moloch too, carried on openly and universally in the heart of a nominally Christian country, and by millions professing the Christian name. So, this, he, he reckons that it was to represent cattle, this horse's head. Well, this, it kind of goes with the same with Shawnee, Sean, the god the god Sean, because um, Shawnee, because they made an offering to the sea, the sea gave back the seaweed, and the seaweed went into the ground um, for fertilisation. Um, so it kind of ties in with agriculture and sustenance, sustenance, crops, cattle, things like that. These gods tie in with that. Anyway, I digress once again. I was confounded, for I did not then know the popery is only a crafty ad adaptation of pagan idolatries to its own scheme. Those midsummer fires and sacrifices were to obtain a blessing on the fruits of the earth, now becoming ready for gathering. Thus I have seen the people running and leaping through the St John's fires in Ireland, and not only proud of passing unsinged, but as if it were some kind of lustration, thinking themselves in an especial manner blessed by the ceremony, of whose original, nevertheless, they were wholly ignorant in their imperfect imitation of it. Dolan's Druids, pages 107-112. The seed of the prophet Cush, Ser Nebogus. The meaning of this name, Kronos, the horned one, as applied to Nimrod, fully explains the origin of the remarkable symbol so frequently occurring among the Nineveh inscriptions. A gigantic horned man bull is represented in the great divinities in Assyria. The same word that signifies a bull signifies also a ruler or prince. Hebrew Shur and Chaldee, Tur, means bull or ruler, whence comes the Latin Taurus. Tyrannus. This also, in a remarkable way, accounts for the origin of the divinities worshipped by our pagan Anglo-Saxon ancestors under the name of Zernebogus. This Zernebogus was the black, malevolent, ill-omened divinity. Sharon Turner's Anglo-Saxons, Volume 1, page 217. In other words, the exact counterpart of the popular idea of the devil as supposed to be black and equipped with horns and hoofs. So here's an interesting illustration, people. And the one on the right here reminds me of the, is it, what's his name? The Assyrian, the fought the lion. He's usually depicted holding the lion's head. Oh, what's his name again? It's just totally flown at my head. But this, and in fact, there's, there's, there's a Scottish stone, an ancient stone with the same uh, carving on it. Where a man is wrestling a lion. Oh, who is the god again? It's just flown away. The name analysed and compared with the accompanying woodcut from Leonard, Nineveh, page 607, casts a very singular light on the source from whence 
has come, the popular superstition in regard to the grand adversary. The name Zero Nabo Gus is also almost pure Chaldee and seems to unfold itself as denoting the seed of the prophet Cush. Zer Nebo Gus, the great seed of the prophet Cush, was of course Nimrod, for Cush was Nimrod's father. Genesis 10, 8. Turn now to Laird and we see how this land of ours and Assyria are thus brought into intimate connection. In the woodcut referred to, first we find the Assyrian Hercules, that is Nimrod the giant, as he is called in Septu Septuagint versions of Genesis without a club or spear or weapons of any kind attacking a bull. Having overcome it, he sets the bull's horns on his head as a trophy of victory and a symbol of power and thence forth the hero is represented as turning next to encounter a lion. Now Nimrod, as the son of Cush, was black, in other words, was a negro. Keeping this, then, in mind, it will seem that in that figure, disentombed from Nineveh, we have both the prototype of the Anglo-Saxon Zer Nebo Gus, the seed of the prophet Cush, and the real original of the black adversary of mankind with horns and hoofs. Hebslops, 2 Babylons, page 55, 3rd edition. The Babylonian cylinder in green jasper referred to, to by Layard, which is from the woodcut was made, may now be seen in the British Museum, along with two other cylinders bearing similar, though not exactly the same design, to one of which follows printed information is attached. Cylinder of lapis lazuli. To the, light, to the right, Gestubar, overcoming a bull. To the left, Kia Ban, Banal, overcoming a lion. Between the two are roughly formed characters, about 2000 BC. Concluding remarks. Lest our readers should misunderstand us in placing these facts before them, we feel it necessary to state that the testimony given in this chapter does not amount to a direct proof of our Isra Israelitish origin, but seems to throw light on the tru truly Babylonish heathen source of some of our religious symbols, festivals and superstitions, which we hold to be unscriptural and foreign to the teachings of Christianity, as revealed to us by our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ and his Apostles. These idolatrous superstitions were embedded in the national life of our ancestors for some time prior to the reception of Christianity, and were preserved by their retention as Christian instead of heathen symbols, festivals and superstitions. If we have in the least degree wounded the tender susceptibilities of our readers by cutting away from under them any Christian feeling they may have entertained in respect to these deep-rooted customs, we trust we may be forgiven as our desire is that we may allow nothing to interfere with their direct communion with our Heavenly Father, whoso com commendeth his love towards us in that, while we were yet sinners, Jesus Christ, his Son, died for us. Okay, guys, part two, Objections Answered, chapter five. Objections Answered, Loss of Language. So people, that was a v another very interesting chapter. It's kind of building up here. I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying reading it. Um, and I relate more to this book than the, the last one about the the Battle of the Boyne. This 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 is more in line with what I'm studying and researching. Anyway people, I hope you enjoyed that and I'll see you in the next chapter. Have a lovely day. Cheers.